Good morning. It's wonderful to welcome you to worship here at Trinity this morning. My name is Lexi Johnson, and I'm the Director of Faith Formation here at Trinity. It's a wonderful Rally Sunday to have you all joining us here for our two regular services again at 8.45 and 11, um, and Sunday School in that in-between time as well. First Sunday School of the Year done. Woohoo! We also want to just highlight to yesterday was the official installation of our Bishop Constanza Hagmeyer. So we're very excited to um, have her take that new call there and very excited for the ministry that she will have with our South Dakota Synod. I know many people that are here worshiping with us um, also into that installation yesterday. So please feel free to talk with each other about it. It was a wonderful, wonderful service. Um, I want to share just a few pieces of it. At the beginning, um, you might note that when we start our worships, we will often either do a confession of forgiveness or we'll do a remembrance of baptism. You might remember either me or one of the pastors standing over here by the baptismal fount, pouring the water and talking about the words and how God's word brewed over the water and recalling different stories um, about water throughout the Bible and remembering our own baptism. When they opened worship yesterday, they did a remembrance of baptism. And in our South Dakota ELCA Synod, there's seven different conferences throughout the state. So there's Bear Butte over West River. There's Prairie Guiteau in the far northeast. And here in Madison, we're in a Madari conference. Now, they had a pastor from each conference come forward with a bowl of water that came from their conference. And they said those words as they poured the water in from their conference into that bowl, bringing water from all across South Dakota together in that time of worship. And it was a very meaningful, wonderful worship. Um, beautiful music as well. I think it made us all very excited to get our own organ back upstairs. Um, so it was wonderful service. Feel free to talk with those about it more, but we'll continue to keep um, Bishop Constanza Hagmeyer. That's gonna have to get some used to saying. It's different. <laughs> to Bishop Constanza Hagmeyer and to Dirk as well as they transition with this time. Um, I invite you to please rise as you are able, and we'll join together in our Confession and Forgiveness, which you can find on page 5 in our black books. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the creator of wind and rain, field and ocean, the bread of life coming down from above, the power at work within us and this world. Before God and in the company of our sisters and brothers, let us confess our sin. God of glory, God of peace, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have thought better of ourselves than others. We have told lies, said hurtful things, acted in ways we wish we could take back and looked the other way when action was needed. In your mercy, O oh God, forgive us, cleanse us, and heal us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. In Christ, you are a new creation. Your sins are taken away, and you are made new. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of God's peace with those around you. Please join together in our opening song, I Will Delight in the Law of the Lord, on page 22.
Let us join together in our prayer of the day, which can be found on the top of your Celebrate insert. Direct us, O Lord God, in all our doings, with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we collect our offering, and I invite you to please join in our offering song, Just a Closer Walk with Thee, on page 32. Our first reading this morning comes from Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your hearts turn away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you, today that I have set before you life and death, 
blessings, and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Philemon 1 through 21. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brothers. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. To Aphi, our sister. To Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all of the saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ, to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Arminus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you, knowing that you will de do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel today comes from Luke in the 14th chapter, verses 25 through 33. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And he turned and he said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not first sit down and consider whether he is able to, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot... Then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Be Please be seated. 
I invite any of the children that are here and with their backpacks or just themselves to come forward for a children's sermon, and we will sing the first verse of Jesus Loves Me as they come up. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. Now, who can tell me, how has school been going for you this year so far? Good. Well, there is definitely a mix of results here. A very big mix. So for those who said good, what's been so great about school? What's been good about school? Who wants to share? Yes. You get to switch your classes. That's fun. Greedy. It's just so great, right? Yes. Playing outside for recess. Getting to play outside for recess. That's so exciting. Very exciting. Anybody else want to share what's exciting? Now, I heard some people that said that school is boring. What is boring about school? OK. OK, so sometimes learning's not always what we want to do. OK. Yeah, Tristan? Say that. School is fun. That's awesome. Now, we have a mix of ways of feeling. Sometimes we're very excited at school, right? And sometimes it's not always very exciting. We've got this mix of things that we're going through. Is there anything about school that ever worries you? Anything that you've ever been worried about? Yeah. Testing. I know testing. That's so scary. Yes. Did you have something to share too, Luke? Yeah. You get to go outside. That's so much fun. Yes, indeed. Very good. Now, with all of these different feelings that we have, exciting and things we're worried about and things that we're kind of tired of, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of peace there, does there? Now, I've got something here today. Who can read this for me? What's it say? OK, and it says, peace be upon you, OK? What does peace mean? Does anybody know? What's that word peace mean? Yeah. When people come together, OK. What else is peace? Mallory, you got something? That's a good answer, yes. Good job. Getting pointers. Peace is definitely something that we want, that calm, that content, people coming together, we're at peace. Now, we just talked about out at school. It doesn't always feel that way. There's lots going on. But I want this to go with you guys, to put on your backpack. It says, peace be upon you. Now, when you go out to these places and you are tired or you're excited or you're scared, however you're feeling, I want you to look at this on your backpack. And I, I want you to remember that peace is with you with Christ wherever you go. That Jesus doesn't just live here at Trinity inside these walls here, but that he goes out there with you into school and to all of the places that you are led to give you that peace. So if you're scared, I want you to remember that promise that Christ is with you to give you that peace. If you're excited, remember that peace that Christ has given you, no matter how you're feeling. So I've got one of, each, um, one of these for each of you to take for your backpack. Um, you can come forward with me and, yep, Tom's got another set over there, so you can head over that way too. Um, before we grab those, though, can let us pray together um, a prayer and a blessing over each and every one of you students. Gracious God, you have promised to keep us safe and holy. Be present with these children and young adults as another school year begins. Give these children and young adults an open and eager mind. Protect all of your children from temptation and guide them with your love. Amen. Go ahead and grab one.
Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your life, have you ever been told that you couldn't do something? Now, I don't know about you, but for me, if I'm told I can't do something, I feel this urge to prove that person wrong, that I'm going to go out and I'm going to do that anyway, just because you said I can't. I feel that desire to do that. I think of my own childhood. I've got three older sisters, and often they would egg me on to do things like older siblings tend to do, tend to say, you can't do this, just to see if the younger sibling will go out and do it. And sometimes I would do that. I remember when we were kids, we had a nice big couch with those nice thick armchairs. And my older siblings, they would stand at, um, on that armchair, and they would face that way so that they, when they would fall backwards, they'd fall on the couch. And it was like a trust fall onto the couch. I don't know if you guys ever did that. But my siblings did that. And we knew we weren't supposed to be doing that. That my parents, my mom was a nurse, and she would not like that very well. Um, but we did it anyway. They told me you couldn't do it, and I was pretty little, and I went and I, and I did it. And of course, I was the one that got caught by my mom and the one that got in trouble. So, But I want you to think about that. How do you react when somebody says, you can't do this? You can't do this. In our text this Sunday, Jesus tells us three different times in this text that you can't be my disciple unless you do this. We hear this three different times in here. He's asking three different things. I'll fill in the blanks of what those three things are as we walk through this text together. But he says, you can't be my disciple. Think about how you react to that. What do you do when someone tells you you can't do something? I think it not only relates to ourselves, but it relates to our own family. I think... Sometimes, maybe as parents, you are talking with other parents and they say that, you know, my kid is really great at doing this. And you feel the urge to prove, well, your child is great as well. My child can do this. This constant need to prove ourselves. And in the midst of that, we're trying to prove our own righteousness. Look how great this is. Look how great... Um, I have it with my job and what I do. Look how great it is what my kid is able to do and how great they are at their sports or their music. Look how great these are. We can do so much. Prior to this in Luke chapter 14, Jesus has been eating meals with our Pharisees the entire time and getting probed over and over again with different questions. Last week, Pastor Dirk preached to you about the wedding banquet and where people are supposed to sit, and they're probing him with these questions, trying to find a loophole, trying to get the answer that they would like. The week before that, the Pharisees were asking Jesus, well, what about working on the Sabbath? What if my ox falls into a hole? Am I supposed to get it out or not? They're trying to trap Jesus in these loopholes. But today in our verse from Luke 14, the tables turn. Jesus has left the Pharisees' house, and he is going out, and he is walking with the crowd. And he's the one that turns to the crowd. They don't ask a question. He turns to them and says the most surprising thing that I think the crowd could have ever heard, saying, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. I have to confess, I did not um, decide to take this text and put it on our Sunday school rooms when we did our remodeling this summer. This isn't the text that we would like to put in our living room um, to have adorn our walls. It's a surprising text. What is Christ asking of us? What is he telling us this? When we read this text, we are so torn as to what is Christ getting at. It just doesn't seem to add up. We think back to our own fourth commandment where it says to honor mother and father, and he's flipping back over and he's telling us now to hate our family. What is he getting at? He's saying the demands of being a disciple is to hate our family. Well, the promise that he's giving us in this text is actually Christ taking claim on us. Think back to our first commandment. You shall have no other gods 
We hear this, and we know that God is our Father. But let's think about the word God in a broader spectrum. What does the word God itself mean? Martin Luther defines God in our large catechism as the term for that which we are to look for all good and in which we are to find refuge in all need. Therefore, to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in the one with your whole heart. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say to you, that is truly your God. What Christ is getting at here is he's reminding us about his role as our father and as our creator. When we go out into our lives with our kids and with our families and our spouse, we are so blessed to have this community around us. But in the midst of it, do we remember who we have to thank for that blessing? Who is our God? Is our God going to be our spouse or our children? Or is our God going to be our Lord and creator who created us and gave us the blessings of our families? He's reminding us that he wants your heart. He wants you to place your trust and your faith in him. When something's going wrong with your family, if there's an illness or if something just goes awry, he wants you to remember that your family's not alone to fix that. Your family's not God, but that God is our creator. Place your faith and your trust in him to look after you, to give you those blessings. He's not turning to us and telling us to disown our families. This isn't a command of lists for us to do to become a disciple, but rather he's taking his stake and putting himself as our God, placing himself as our Savior, knowing that we alone cannot do it. Our righteousness is not in what we've accomplished with our family. That's our first one that God tells us here, that Christ tells us isn't about being a disciple. Our second one he gets at is about bearing the cross. Same here. In our own lives, it can seem easy for us to want to fix things ourselves, to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and, and fix our problem. But in the midst of what's going on in our lives, are we remembering God as our creator there? Is our righteousness found within ourselves and in our own abilities to take care of what's going on? Or is it in faith and in trust and God to be there, to continue to create. Today in Sunday school, our lesson for our kids was the creation story. And we hear the beautiful text from Genesis about God creating all of the world around us. I think it's important for us to remember that he's not done creating. That didn't stop there after Genesis 1. In each and every single one of your lives and in the world around us, he is still creating and giving us those blessings. He's given us our families. He's given us our identity with our vocations and the places that he's called us to, to go out and serve. He's called us in our schoolwork if we're students studying. He's there in the midst of all of that, continuing to create. He truly is our God. And he's in this text, taking our hearts back into his own. He's reminding us that he's our creator and that he is going to be there to support you and your family, yourself, and all of the different roles that you play. He's reminding us of that. He's taking our hearts back. What exactly does this mean, though, to put God first? For God to take our hearts, this first commandment, to actually have God be our God, what does this look like? And again, it means that God is that holder of your heart. What does your heart cling to? In times of good, are you thankful for God for the blessings that are in your life? We remember God is at work in providing us with everything that we have, from our families to our food to our property. Do we remember that this is all a blessing from God? I often think of when we receive a meal, are we quick to thank the person that made it for us? Do we also remember that God is the one that provided us with the fields to create the crop that we get on our plate as well. It's remembering that, remembering that God is our God and that he's going to be there with us no matter what happens in our lives. 
the third time that Jesus says to us that we cannot be our disciple unless he's talking about possessions. And it's the same there. When it comes down to your house or your property, anything like that, what he's getting at here is that he wants you to be the go-to. When something goes wrong, remember to place that faith and that trust in him, not in your own money to fix your problems or in your own property to fix your problems, but to place him as truly your God. Yesterday at the installation, our sending hymn was a hymn called The Mighty Fortress is Our God, a very, some people call it the Lutheran National Anthem. It's a very Lutheran hymn. And the last verse to that, that we walked out to says, were they to take our house, our goods, our honor, our child, or our spouse, the life itself be wrenched away. Luther here is addressing exactly this. If our faith and our God is in our property and we lose our property, what do we have left? If our faith is in our own abilities and all of a sudden we lose that ability, what do we have left? Our God is taken away from us then. He's reminding us here that he is the one giving us those blessings and that he is going to be your God, your father, your creator, and he is still creating anew in each and every single one of you, and he always will be. Remember that he is the holder of your heart. Pray to your God, your father. Place your hope in him alone. In his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able and join us in our hymn, More Precious Than Silver, on page 63. Please be seated. 
At this time, we will have a blessing and an installation for our Trinity Education volunteers. So this includes um, Sunday school teachers, to confirmation guides, to high school Bible study, to our own preschool here at Trinity that we want to lift up and to bless. And please continue to keep them in your thoughts and prayers as they continue their ministry with our youth this year. As I read their name, I would invite them to please come forward. Lana Johnson, Leanne Runick, Amy Thrun, Danielle Jensen, Chelsea Gerdes, Dana Hoff, Mallory Schultz, Tanya Meadows, Christy Allum, Lori Engebretson, Marissa Jenks, Kelly Bender, Lizzie Ellingson, Megan Schneider, Braxton Bender, Marissa Nussbaum, Melody Hansen, Stacy Riedel, Tara Engels, Holly Van Dyke, Mackenzie Ryan, Marinda Kern, Christy Layton, Julie Jones, Betsy Shamber, Katie Abraham, Brandon and Shelley Gust, Bridget Van Leer, Dan Lemmy, Tammy Christensen, Summer Durant, Alicia Cook, Kevin Streff, Ashley Yonke, Becky Fierstad, Chris Morse, Stacy Allwelling, Becky Brown, and if we have ninth graders that are helping out, if you guys would please come forward as well. Wonderful. At the first service, I invited, if there's any kids that are impacted by these individuals, if they would want to come up as well and join these teachers, um, I invite them to come forward and join them as well as we give them a blessing. There's a couple. <laughs> All right. <laughs> these individuals... Um, are doing some amazing ministry here at Trinity and all that we do here would not be possible without them and their ministry and their servant hearts and serving in these capacities. So we are super thankful and super blessed to have each and every single one of you blessing the youth here at Trinity. Let us join together as a congregation with a prayer over our Trinity education volunteers. Gracious God, we gather as a community to raise before you the educational ministry of this congregation. Keep each one of us in the covenants of our baptism, that we may eagerly seek to know your word and your will. Help us to live faithful lives and be eager agents of your transforming power as we go and make your disciples in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give these individuals a round of applause, please? Thank you. <laughs> Please rise as you are able and join us in the Spirit Intercedes for us on page nine. Sustained and nurtured by our generous God, we gather as one to pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Turn our hearts, O oh God. Make us attentive to your call to take up the cross-shaped way of life and to share your good news with a world in need. Lord, in your mercy. Turn our hearts toward life and all its infinite varieties. We pray especially for vanishing and endangered creatures who struggle to find a home in this world. Open our eyes to the value of your interconnected relationships within your natural world. Lord, in your mercy. Turn our hearts toward all who yearn for calm and fairness. Where there is violence and conflict, grant peace. Where there is disparity, grant justice. 
Where there is hatred and fear, grant compassion and empathy. Lord, in your mercy. Turn our hearts toward all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those in bondage to sin, addiction, poverty, physical slavery, or human trafficking, and those incarcerated or detained. For those in any need of prayer, especially those we now name in our heart. Lord, in your mercy. Turn our hearts toward the ministries of our congregations that feed the hungry, share with the needy, advocate for the silenced, and work for your justice. Embolden our hearts to labor without fear. Lord, in your mercy. Turn our hearts toward your internal reign. We give thanks for our sisters and brothers who have died, trusting the promise of life forever with you. Marked by the cross of Christ, inspire us by their examples to live in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Assured by your promise to hear us, we lay our prayers before your throne of grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. be seated for a few announcements. Starting this week, lots of different programming will start up again. First to highlight the High School Bible City will start again this Wednesday. Um, so come and join us for that. They usually meet 6.30, 6.45. Yep, and it'll go until about 8 o'clock. So come and join for that. There'll be pizza. It'll be wonderful. There'll be Becky Brown. It'll be great. Um, Confirmation Open House is also this Wednesday, so starting from 4 to 6, we'll be kicking off with 7th and 8th graders um, to come in and get them signed up and registered for that. 9th grade and 5th and 6th grade pre-confirmation will start the following Wednesday, the 18th, so just to highlight that. Coffee and Cookies with the Council as well is next Sunday, the 15th, so come and join us from 3 to 5 to meet with your council members, to bring any thoughts, any questions, things like that, to have that conversation with our council members. They look forward to having that time with you as well. Want to highlight as well, the first through fourth graders are invited to join our Covenant Choir starting on September 11th. That'll be from 515 till 6. Choirs and all of that will be starting up again um, as well coming here. So very exciting. We also, if you haven't had the chance yet to go check out the remodeled Sunday school rooms, I want to invite you to go check those out. There's been some amazing helpers throughout the summer that have shared their times and gifts and talents, sprucing up those spaces, some fresh colors, some um, memory work on the walls, different things like that. So go ahead and check out those spaces, the top and bottom floor. So then thank you to all of those that have helped with that along the way as well. I'll invite uh, Terry to come forward as well. He's got an announcement for us. Also, if there's some left leftover backpack tags, if you didn't get one, or if you know somebody that would like one, please feel free to take one of those as well. Thank you, Lexi. So everyone, we'd like to uh, introduce plan 
I think G now for Rally Sunday. Uh, we were not outside in tents or in a cold chair in the rain, so um, we just want to announce we'll be serving pork loin or pork, pulled pork sandwiches. Um, Dana's awesome homemade potato salad. I highly recommend it. That'll be back there. So we'll be serving in the kitchen, and we will also um, be serving sandwiches, chips, and drinks, and cookies in the narthex on the way out. So please don't leave without it. Uh, Scott Delzer here, the captain of the Trinity skydiving team, is going to be up there <laughs> to assist you with your sandwiches, and he can give you a ride too. I heard so. Anyways, please don't leave without that, and uh, we hope to be back in our sanctuary early October, and uh, obviously we'll be all appreciative of, it, pre appreciative of it when we're able to use all our space, and uh, we're going to uh, really enjoy it. Things are shaping up there, so um, that's our announcements for, so thank you. Thank you, Siri. Wonderful. We want to invite... Oh, oh yes. Also... Yes, the wonderful Sunday school rooms, those are places to sit, too. So take a sandwich and, and take a look at what uh, Lexi did with the uh, Sunday school rooms. They look awesome, so they're places to sit down and eat as well. Yeah. Um, we want to invite, too, the kids to feel free to come forward. There's musical instruments, ribbons. Come on forward for our sending hymn. Please rise as you are able and join us on page 165. Christ loved us. Thank you. 